thank you for taking time uh, to be here this evening and tomorrow night and Saturday morning. It's going to be a, a powerful rally, and uh, we need God to move. And so we appreciate every pastor, a worker, labor. These pioneer rallies have a purpose. And uh, the aim of these rallies is to uh, stir men and women for God many times, as we've heard, and to keep us on track. If you have your Bible this evening, Luke 14. And so we have to deal with issues of the heart that keep us from drifting. Uh, we don't want to morph into something that's unrecognizable. Uh, the more churches we have, some 2,700 plus, the wider spread we are geographically, various places around the world, and then added the issue of time, generational time. All of these bring a concern that somewhere along the path um, there's this mutation of our fellowship. Uh, we begin to become deformed into something that God never called us to be or Pastor Mitchell never intended us to be. If we are going to continue to win the world for Jesus Christ, if we are going to continue to make disciples and pioneer churches, impact nations, there are some things that must never change. Some things we cannot lose. This evening I want to preach on things we cannot lose. Luke 14, verse 27, and verse 20, or 33, Jesus speaking. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, cannot be my disciple. I want to challenge you this evening, things we cannot lose. Father, we come tonight by the blood. We come by the power of the Holy Ghost and your word. We thank you for the churches represented, God, these people that are here tonight. I pray, God, that you would drive in reference points deeper and deeper, never to be lost. God, give us nations as an inheritance. Bless these congregations. Give them increase and enlargement in these troubled times, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Things we cannot lose. In our text, Jesus said, come after me. He's saying, I want you to join yourself to me. Will you allow me to lead you? He's talking about relationship. He's talking about something that's very personal. Over and over, he uses the terminology, will you follow me or follow me? He gives this cry when he looks out across the landscape of humanity and men. He said, follow me. Matthew 4, 19, he said to them, he's talking to Peter and Andrew, follow me and I will make you. Come be with me, he's saying. I want you to listen to me. I want you to watch me. I want relationship with you. Will you allow me to direct your life? Can I speak into your life when it comes to personal issues dynamic of the heart. I want you to follow me 
Because there's this impartation by association. It's called discipleship. And I will make you. I will fashion you. I'm going to begin to create something perhaps you never imagined you could be. I want to begin to transform you as a human being. I want to impart these spiritual dynamics. I want to give you vision like you've never had vision. I want to stir your heart for kingdom business. And I want to give direction to your life. Paul, the old King James, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, become followers of me even as I also am of Christ. The new King James, Paul is saying, come imitate me just as I imitate Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, you became followers of us in the Lord. Let me ask you a question this evening. Who are you following? Can anyone lead you? Does anyone have a spiritual relationship with you to such a degree that it will make you and shape you and form you into a powerful instrument for God. Pastor, who's following you? What are you making out of those God has given you influence with? This is discipleship. This is a spiritual impartation these conversations, these instructions, insights, correction, revelation, training, stirring, teaching, that I may make you follow me and I will make you. I'll disciple you. I'll begin to take what God has deposited in me and by the Spirit, I'll deposit it in you. Watch me. Watch my example. You reproduce what you are, not what you say you are. If it's not in you, it's very difficult to impart it into others. Yours is Years ago, Pastor Mitchell, uh, there was a leader, and uh, Pastor Mitchell and I were very concerned about this leader, and uh, we were having these conversations, and I made a statement to Pastor Mitchell. He later preached this. I said, Pastor, it's just not in him. It's just not in him. This man had gifting, he had talent, he had personality, he could preach, but he was losing credibility as a leader and he was making some bad decisions. He was saying a lot of strange things and so Pastor Mitchell called him to Prescott and he asked me to be there in this meeting, and Pastor Mitchell began to lay out this whole list of various things, violations. And he finally said, I don't see how it's possible you're going to stay in this position of leadership. And I suggested to this man, I said, listen, why don't you volunteer? Why don't you volunteer you to go to Africa Build something for God. Rebuild your credibility. Get alone. Let God get a hold of you. Later it came back to me. He was insulted that I even would suggest such a thing. He returned to his nation. Tried to pull the church. 
Today he works in a mortuary. It just was not in him. The question tonight, what's in you? Because every one of you, you may not be a pastor, but every one of you have influence. You have influence at home. You have influence in the church. You have influence with people. What are you making with that influence? We can never lose this. Come after me. Follow me. He said, I'm going to impart vision to you. I'm going to give you a view of the harvest fields you never before possessed. The souls of men and women, nations, cities, these massive mega cities. Come be like me. Come and see what I see. Hear what I hear. Can you hear the cry? of the multitude, the broken, the lonely, the bound, the rejected, the lost, the forsaken. The world is filled with multitudes of these people. Jesus, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He said, I would gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks. But you would not. This is more than an intellect. It's more than just program and method. This is heart. This is spirit. This is the fire and the passion of the heart and the spirit of God. It's the Apostle Paul, this one encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Lord, what would you have me do? No longer what I want to do, but Lord, what would you have me do? Let me ask you this evening, when you're around people, Do you stir them to ask that question? Lord, what would you have me do? Have you made that statement to God this evening? Lord, what would you have me do? Not what I want to do. Not maybe what my family expects me to do. Not what maybe my classmates expect. But Lord, what would you have me do? We can't ever lose this. So radical, Philippians 3.8. Yes, indeed, I also count all things, Paul said, as dung. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Can you grasp that? He said, everything the world could offer me, when I compare it to knowing you and living for you and following, it's like dung. He said, I've lost everything that the world would count a value, and I count it as rubbish. What a radical statement. No wonder this man, two-thirds of the New Testament, no wonder his words still impact people today. Have you lost that? I remember my first Prescott conference back in the 70s. And I can remember the old pews there, and I asked pastor and a friend of mine who had been instrumental in us even being there. I, these streaks were on the old pews. And they, they were like these streaks down through the varnish. And, and I said, what in the world is that? And he said, Joe, that's the tears of people under conviction, weeping for nations, 
weeping for cities. I remember when I first went in the old church. I walked through the front door and I heard this roar coming up on my left. I said, what in the world? And I walked down in the basement and here were these people praying. You couldn't even walk through the, you couldn't even move people back. I mean, bunched and, and just stacked in there and this roar coming out. We can't ever lose that. Are you still weeping for souls? Are you still saying, follow me? Are you still saying, Lord, what would you have me do? Can you hear the voice of Jesus Christ? Uh, can you hear him say in John 4, 35, do you not say there are still four months and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I said, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white for harvest. What do you see this evening? What's your vision? What floods your heart? What moves you? This element that transforms people from just, I mean, just they come from every background and walk of life and insanity, and they come into the church, uh, and there's this chemistry and this dynamic that begins to move them into another dimension, a spiritual dimension with God. Uh, or now it's no longer about me. But Lord, it's about you and what you would have me to do from now to the grave. Follow me. Elijah, he's come through a hard time, a desperate time of discouragement and God says I want you to go find Elisha he finds Elisha plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he cast his mantle on Elisha picture of the calling the anointing ministry can God cast the mantle can your pastor cast the mantle on you this evening can your pastor speak a word and something in your heart, like Jesse was mentioning, begins to pound the beat? I can do something for God. Are you casting the mantle? We cannot lose this. Secondly, this evening, we must never lose the cross. The cross, the place of death and sacrifice. In our text again, verse 20, whoever does not bear or take up his cross and come after me, it's not just coming after. We have to bring something with us called the cross or we cannot be a disciple. The cross, the place where flesh is crucified. Attitudes die. Paul, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you taking up the cross? What does that mean to you? I've been crucified with Christ. What is your cross? Romans 6, 6, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with no longer slaves to sin. Has your flesh been nailed to the cross? The appetites of your flesh... The lust of your flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. 
the flesh that's living in you that fights the call of God, the will of God, the separation unto God, the sanctification unto God. Jesus puts out a call in Luke 14. Same chapter as our text, he puts out this call. He said, I want you to go call these people. I have need for them. Watch what happens. The Bible says they all begin to make excuse. Luke 14, I've married a wife. I cannot come. Please have me an excuse. See, the cross is designed to crucify flesh that puts relationships before God. Flesh that puts family and children and parents and, and people before the call and the kingdom and the ministry of God. Have you nailed that to the cross? Plans with people instead of plans for God. The next one said, I bought a piece of ground. I cannot come. I must go see it. Property. The dream home. The place of security, comfort, the familiar, and many times the debt trapped in geography. I cannot respond to God because I've been trapped in a geographic location. Have you taken that to the cross? Another says, I bought five yoke of oxen. I have to go test them. Employment, ability to make money. Career, the ability to make money to buy things. I can't come. All of, I mean the insanity. I bought property I've never seen. I bought uh, yokes of oxen I've never tested. And these in themselves are not evil. But in their mind, this excused them. From the call, the cross is a place where things are slaughtered. Elisha, as I mentioned, when Elijah cast the mantle on him, the Bible said he took the utensils, the plows were made of wood and et cetera, and scholars feel he built an altar and he sacrificed the oxen. He burned them. And he followed Elijah. What do you need to slaughter and burn that you can follow a man of God, that you can follow destiny, that you can follow the Lord into another dimension, a place of sacrifice? Take up your cross, he said, a place of death to the past. If you don't kill the past, in times of difficulty and struggle, barrenness sometimes, you will be powerfully tempted to return. Elisha didn't just say goodbye. He burnt, he made a statement. I'm never going back to that. Have you done that dimension of the cross? Are there things you need to burn? Are there things that need to be annihilated? Second Corinthians 5.15, he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. 
The cross is a place where self and flesh is nailed and crucified. As long as you're full of yourself, you'll never be hungry for God. You can't follow Jesus and hold on to the past. Jesus said, any man put his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Why would you be looking back? Because there are things there that you haven't crucified. We can't lose this. Philippians 3.10, that you may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. No cross, no resurrection, no crown, no calling, no move of God. What needs to die this evening in you that Christ can live? Have you lost your cross somewhere? Have you buried it in the desires of your flesh? Have you buried it in the chambers of recreation and pleasures of this world and entertainment? Shh, Christ, just be, be quiet, cross. Shh, don't, shh, shh, just, just, just go over there and behave. Don't be bothering me. Just be quiet. Not now, one, one day, one day, but not, not, not right. Just take a nap, would you? Take a nap. <laughs> to lose the cross is to lose Christ. Think of this. Pastor and Sister Mitchell went back to Australia at the age of 80, he was. At the time, I was 60-something, and... Um, I thought, I'm talking to Pastor Mitchell down. Some may remember we had the rally, men's rally downtown in, in the um, school there. I was saying, of course you can go. What? Come on, you got to go, Pastor. You're the one that can go. Nobody's able to do this. Like, and I'm, you know, and now I'm almost 80, and I'm thinking, Shh, you must have been insane saying those things. <laughs> but think of this. They went to Australia at 80. You're 30 and you can't go to California and Pioneer Church? Come on. You can't get up for prayer? You're 27 and you can't make it to outreach? What do you think the cross is? A piece of jewelry? <laughs> it's a place where the flesh... It's a place where you deny self. Luke 19, or 9, 23 and 24, he said to them all, let me ask you, can Jesus say it to you this evening? Can he speak to you this evening? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Let him deny Himself. Self has dreams that have nothing to do with God. Self has lifestyles that do not coordinate with God's call and will and purpose. Self paints these images that oppose God. He'll paint these desires and imaginations, if you're not careful, will consume your heart and mind. Blind you to what God has. Flesh and faith cannot coincide. 
They can't live together in you. Sometimes in deny himself is mostly internal. Demas has forsaken me, Paul said, having loved this present world. What lured him back? You never hear of this man again. No doubt great potential. He's on this missionary journey with Paul. Be careful what you love. I love to go there. I love to dream about. I love to talk about. Problem is, it's not God. Do not love the world, though the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Think about Abraham. Call the father of our faith the friend of God. Why is that? What does God call you? Abraham was not perfect. There's the Egypt stuff. There's the Hagar stuff. So why would God say he's my friend? He's the father of the faith. I believe it was this moment called sacrifice. Not sacrificing something evil, but something he loved, his dream his future, Genesis 22, 2. Then God said, Abraham, I want you to take now your son, your only son, Isaac, who you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer them there as a burnt offering. So Abraham arose early. What do you need to sacrifice that you love this evening? God will say, you're my friend. I can't hide anything from you. You're a man. You're a woman of faith. Sacrifice. What's God calling you to sacrifice tonight? Launching couples can be a sacrifice in a lot of ways. We're launching Sunday night, last ones. The birch is going to India. You know, we, we're, we're talking 10 couples. We're talking around 35 people, two of our best givers. <laughs> I'm talking best, best. <laughs> bye bye, dollars. Bye bye. You don't just launch people. You launch influence, you launch ministry, you launch talent, you launch gifting. Will you make that sacrifice? Let me close. We can't lose the following because that's discipleship. We can't lose the cross because that's where flesh is harnessed, crucified, so we can go. And last of all, we can't lose the forsake all. Luke 14, 33, so likewise, whoever of you, ever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Pastor Mitchell, I remember preaching this sermon various places around the world, and he'd make the statement, oh, you're willing to go, but you're planning to stay. Being willing is not enough. Lip service is not enough. Saying, here am I, send me, is not the same as actually leaving. Leaving. And forsaken. Peter, this account is recorded in three Gospels. I read from Matthew 19, 20, 27. When Jesus made these statements, 
It's after the rich young ruler and all of that. Peter answered and said to Jesus, See, we've left all and followed you. What shall we have? I wonder what Peter was referring to. Maybe he's referring to, remember the story when Jesus there on the Sea of Galilee borrowed the boat, launched out into the deep, and, and you know, he ministered and he came back and Peter and them, they had toiled all night and caught nothing. He said, they're rolling up the nets. He said, launch out in the deep for a, for a catch. Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. We've been barren. There's no fruitfulness. Nothing's happening. Nevertheless, at your word. You know the story. Luke 5, 6, the nets were breaking there's such a great catch. He had to call John and bring your boat. Uh, both of the boats were sinking. And the Bible says when they brought their boats to land, verse 11, they forsook all and followed Jesus. Think of this. Possibly the greatest financial opportunity of their entire life. At the moment of this incredible material blessing, right at that moment, at many times when you're ready to step out and forsake all, right at that moment, I remember years ago when I decided to go full-time in the ministry for $25 a week, living in, living in the attic church with two kids, Connie and I. And I went in, and I, I was working for the telephone industry, and Mr. Gooch says, said, Joe, you can't do this. We've just had a meeting. We're going to promote you, Supervisor Southern Illinois. And he's talking about bonuses in an automobile. Right when I said, you know what? But the Bible says when they brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed Jesus. Whenever you refuse to forsake what God is calling you away from, Right there, the clock stops. If you're not careful, you'll be stuck in that chapter for the rest of your life until you decide, i got to let this go. I wonder how many ministries are stuck. How many of God's disciples are stuck because the Lord dealt, you need to forsake this. You need to let this go. You need to walk away from that. You need to turn that loose. And you said, no. When you forsake all and follow him, this positions you for enlargement. This positions you for double portion ministry. This begins to elevate you to new levels of revelation. Jesus' response to Peter when he said, look, we've forsaken all and follow you. And I'm not sure all this means, but he said, when the Son of Man sits on the thrones of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones. And everyone who has left, and he talks about houses and family and lands for my sake in the gospel, you shall receive a hundredfold in this life and then inherit eternal life. He said, when you do this, there's this increase in enlargement. There's this hundredfold return, this portion that I was waiting to present and make alive and real when you forsake. 1987, Connie, J. Rell, and I 
I was 46 years old, pastor in this church. We went to Malaysia. Wasn't easy to leave. We were in revival here. It was a dream, dream church. Thank God for the Chandler Church. But we went to Malaysia. It was in Malaysia as we were there, and everything wasn't easy. There was a big coup, all kind of dynamics. But I'll never forget being in that Indian restaurant and watching these. It was outdoors. It was a massive restaurant. Here's these young Indian men. They're waiters. And I mean, they're, they're active. They're diligent. They're, they're organized. And I said, God, 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 something in my heart. Give us India. God, give us. If I had not have gone to Malaysia, would that door, that effectual door, have been open today's 30 plus churches in India? <laughs> Just had this, and they had this incredible conference live stream. I was just recently with Richard Ruby and he brought something to my attention that I hadn't really thought about. He said, and, and there was some other pastors there, he said, China broke loose. Richard's been to Malaysia many times. His father, when he was living, went there with him. Yolanda's been there. He said, when China broke loose in our fellowship, it happened when a few of those pastors took some of their converts and went to the rally in Malaysia and they saw discipleship at work in an Asian culture and nation and something exploded that we can do this. When you forsake all and follow Christ... And it may be difficult. It may be there's opposition. We know that. There's all kinds of activity. But when you do that, it qualifies you for another opportunity. Another door. Another nation. If all of that is true, those are the two largest nations in the world. Today, China is all but closed. But we have national workers in there on fire for God. Uh, We have churches there on fire for God. Will you forsake all and follow him? What do you need to forsake tonight? That will loose you. Remove the restrictions. The limitations. Qualify you for a hundredfold ministry and anointing and dominion and fruitfulness. Listen, there are some things we can never lose. I'm speaking to another generation, maybe two, three generations. Listen, listen to me, young people. You cannot circumvent this. No matter how much knowledge you have, You may have been born in our fellowship. You've got it down, but you cannot escape this. Will you be that man or woman? That couple. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you. Pastor, I got my eye on you. I'm going to allow you to speak to me. I'm going to take this cross and beat my flesh to death. That's what Paul said. I buffet my body. And I'm telling you, I'm going to forsake it all. I ask you to bow your head with me this evening. Lord, we love you in this place. Heads are bowed. No one's moving for a few moments. You're here in this place. I want you to give me your attention. You're unsaved. You're not living for God. Caught in sin. Trapped in addictions. 
involved in stuff that's unclean and has nothing to do with God. You're here tonight. You need to repent. Maybe you've never been saved, never born again, raised in church, but unsaved. Maybe you're a visitor tonight or a backslider. Before we do anything else, you're here tonight. You'd say, Pastor, I need to get my heart right with God. That's what I need to do. The only way for that to happen is honest repentance. God, it's me. I'm sorry. I need you to forgive me. I'm sick of hiding this and carrying this sin. That's you this evening. You'd lift your hand. Lift it up right now. God's dealing with you. The love of God, grace of God speaking to you. Here's my hand, Pastor. Here's my hand. I'm unsaved. I'm not right with God. I see your hand. God bless you. Thank you. Who else? You'd join the, who else? I see this hand. God bless you. Thank you. Who else? You'd lift your hand. How many others? You'd lift your hand. That's me. I'm not right. I'm not right. I'm tired of playing games. I need to come home. I want to come clean. Who else? Who else? Who else? Backslider. Who else? That's me. That's me. That's me, Pastor. That's me. That's me. Anyone else? Anyone else? You lifted your hand. Would you lift it again? Your hand, I want you to lift your eyes and look at me. Your hands lifted. Sincere with God. Sincere with God. I believe you. I want you to get up out of your seat and come. Someone's going to pray with you. Would you come? Would you come right here? Would you come? Would you come? Someone's going to pray with you. Someone's going to pray with you. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. God will give you a miracle. I'm going to ask you to stand with me all over this building. I believe God is dealing with many. I want to open these altars. I want you to come and find a place to pray. I want you to come talk to God. I want you to come speak to God. I've been hesitant. I've been resisting. I've been holding things I need to let go of. I need to nail some flesh to the cross. I need to burn some old dreams from the world that have nothing to do with God. I want to make myself available tonight. If you're at your seat, you may be seated. I want to make myself totally available. I don't want anything, anything to hinder me. I don't want anything to hinder me from what God has for me. Oh, Oh, God, I praise you, Lord. God, I praise you, my Lord and my God, I praise you. Oh, Ramashandai. Pastor Mitchell preached a sermon back in the 70s on Abraham when he left the Ur of the Chaldees, and he made the statement over and over again. Are you willing to leave what you have to obtain that which you cannot see? Are you willing to turn loose of what you have? to obtain that which you cannot see. That's a powerful statement. Abraham left the Ur of the Chaldees not knowing where he was going, the Bible says. What about you tonight? What do you need to turn loves of? This generation are buried in clutter of the flesh. Bombarded, overwhelmed, saturated with the social media, 
What do you need to turn loose of? What do you need to burn and bury, nail to the cross? That God take you places you never imagined. Use you in dimensions you didn't even know existed. That's what God wants to do. Would you give God one more praise? Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you.